Hi, Justin. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Southern California? Things are great. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm pleased to be here with you. Justin, I'm looking forward to this discussion. 2021 was a seminal year and we have a lot to discuss. And I also want to get your views on where the price is going in 2022. But before we do that, I want to provide you with an overview on where I want to take our discussion in the next few minutes. And I want to begin with a brief overview of Uranium Insider and how you became involved in, in Uranium, followed by an overview of 2021 and the highlights of the year, an overview of the spot market and term market, an overview of Chinese contracting and what it means to the long-term Uranium price, an overview of taxonomy and what it means to the uranium price, and conclude with where the uranium price is going in 2022. Justin, let's begin with a brief background on yourself and your company, Uranium Insider, and how you became interested in uranium. Sure. Um, I, I became interested in uranium uh, at first in 2016. That's when the, the thesis first came to me. It actually was via a podcast it was wall street unplugged with frank curzio and he interviewed i believe it was um uh, jordan trimble from sky harbor resources and of course you know they're always very bullish and that was very well timed i think that interview was late 2016 which was actually the bottom for the commodity which is about 18 dollars a pound um and the thesis was clear back then because it was so much lower than the the cost of the, the average cost of production at that time and, and far far lower below the marginal cost of production which ends up mattering when you have a severe supply deficit um, you know prior to that thesis coming to me I was I was primarily a, a trend following you know momentum swing trader and uh, you know I would do technical trades that I knew absolutely nothing about the company absolutely nothing about the sector uh, the person that took me under his wing and taught me um, his methods for technical trading basically said, you want to know as little as possible about the thing you're buying. You want to come with an unbiased view of the chart and that's it. And so that's what I learned and what I kind of grew with um, at some point, kind of maybe around the 2015, 2016 timeframe, I started to kind of incorporate some fundamentals into um, the technical trading. So if I, if I understood why, why a stock gapped up on big volume, that could give me some sort of further conviction behind uh, taking that trade. Of course, you know, you still want to be um, unabashedly unemotional about exiting and entrances when, you, when you're trading technically um, and have firm rules and stick to them. But when the uranium thesis came to me, it was just really, really intriguing, not only for uh, the reasons of the previous bull market being of epic proportions and um, investors making just amazing amounts of money and return on the capital in three or four short years, um, but also this idea of a contrarian play where you're slowly, patiently building positions in a sector you know someday will turn. You might not know when, but it's somewhere between two and 10 years or something. You know, at 2016, at that point, everybody was saying it was right around the corner. But, you know, the more you dig into it, the more you realize it's not exactly around the corner. Um, there's still a lot of mobile inventory to work through, et cetera. But I was very attracted to this. It was very low stress for me. For some reason, it just fit with my personality to um, understand the sector fundamentally and build on that understanding. Research companies on a on a reasonable time frame without being in a rush to take a position, and deciding where to position capital slowly and doing so over a number of years when when there was weakness in the market. And that's what I did. And um, over the years, I made some great connections on Twitter built up a following there by connecting with some of the other prominent um, uranium mines that are on Twitter, which there are some very, very intelligent uh, people that that know a lot about this market on Twitter. Um, and that just kind of turned naturally into what we're doing now with Uranium Insider Pro, the, the investing newsletter. And I did a free newsletter for a while and that ended up, you know, just kind of turning into this, what we're doing now, simply do out of demand and, and requests from from people that I was communicating with at the time saying, hey, if you ever do something something paid that involves your actual stock picks and a more in-depth uh, cover of the sector, I'm interested. And I got so many messages like that, that it just was a natural fit. And that was August of 2019. So a little more than two years into um, the paid newsletter, it's it's grown into a, a very uh, sizable community. And um, it's, it's really been a fantastic experience. And it, during those two years, 
uh, the setup for uranium has only just expanded exponentially in terms of fundamental uh, fundamental factors. So give us a sense of your model portfolio. How do you pick stocks? How many stocks do you have in there? Do you look at market caps? Do you have a, a minimum market cap that you would invest in? Are you focused on jurisdiction? How do you pick your exact stocks? Sure. We have a model portfolio of uh, a 10 positions maximum. Um, right now, I believe we have nine positions in there. One of those is an is an option spread. Uh, so we do do options trades on occasion when when the risk and reward is looking uh, attractive. But um, as far as the companies go, we tend to steer away from the ultra small cap, micro cap, explorer companies. Um, those, if they make a discovery during a bull market, as you all know, can probably be the largest winners in the whole space. But in the uranium space, there's only 65 companies that are publicly traded, and so um, our, we have a process for choosing those companies, and that process involves looking at jurisdiction, looking at the asset or assets, um, very, looking very closely at management, um, looking at the share structure for the company is a really important thing that we definitely take a take into account. We don't necessarily have a minimum market cap, but we do shy away from, especially kind of the, the low float micro caps, not only just because of um, you know the, the the size of the newsletter, but also just the risk of you know it's kind of a gamble betting on Explorer, right? Um, so we like developing companies. We like companies especially that have um, a story that they're continuing to write as the bull market carries on. Those are our favorite companies. Companies that have management that acts respectfully towards shareholders, that owns a good chunk of the company, and they ha they have a plan so that they have individual company catalysts, regardless of what the actually running market does. And if the uranium market does what we think it will do, then these companies that have these own individual catalysts will perform far better than the companies that have an asset that discovered 10 years ago. They're just sitting around waiting for the price to rise, which is probably half of the sector. And Justin, what's your performance like since inception and also year to date? Since inception, we're, uh, we're about 490% return since August of 2019. Year to date, we're at about 130%. Um, the last I calculated was about a week ago and it was a bit higher and we had a good correction here, although it bounced pretty nicely today. Um, so yeah, year to date, about 130% since inception, just under 500%. And just to clarify, you don't actually run money. This is a model, model portfolio and um, you just make recommendations in your newsletter. Correct. We don't manage other people's money at all. We do have a model portfolio. Um, we do take the same trades that we recommend um, at the same time that we recommend them. So we don't front run trades on the buy or the sell side. Um, we actually have a window where we don't allow ourselves to touch the stock around these recommendations so that sometimes we often personally get worse positions than our members do. But that's just the way it goes. We don't ever want to have the reputation of front running, which I know not a lot of newsletters do. And what about this year in terms of turnover? Like you said, you currently own nine names. Have you owned those nine names for most of the year or has it been turned over quite a bit? We've had um, about a dozen trades in this past year. And so those have been either companies that we decided to sell out of entirely and to reposition that cash. Um, they've been, there's been two options trades that we have taken and exited over the course of this year. These are typically bullish call spreads. Um, and then we have, uh, we've taken on a number of half size positions. So we've, so we've, with the cash proceeds from these option spreads and from selling one or two companies, we have a few positions that are half, half sized in terms of their weighting of the total portfolio. So that's a great overview of Uranium Insider. Let's move on now. I wanna pick your brain a little bit about the spot market and also the term market. And why don't we just begin by defining what is the spot market and the term market and what's the difference between the two markets? Sure. <clears throat> the spot market essentially is um, a, a market in which any trade of uranium um, happens within a 12 month delivery. So it's essentially, it's not a whole lot different than the term market besides the delivery timeframe. Although typically the term market involves contracts where the spot market can often involve just purchasing material that's sitting in a can at one of the conversion facilities, um, trading hands on paper. Uh, and so the spot market is usually uh, involved with uh, uranium traders 
And there are some producers that do sell into the spot market. That is primarily to traders. In the past, it's been the utilities. The utilities are largely out of the spot market currently. Um, my opinion of that is because the spot market is relatively thin. Utilities are not necessarily in the business of pushing the price up. So they're more interested in the term market currently. So the term market is anything beyond 12 month delivery. Typically that will involve a contract between a utility and a producer or a utility and a carry trader. And um, these contracts can look a, a variety of ways. One common way that they looked will be um, um, partially referenced to the spot price at the time of delivery and partially fixed to a particular price that the buyer and seller agree upon. So you might have, for example, a contract with a utility with Cameco in 2015 for uh, 2020 to 2025 delivery, <clears throat> excuse me, with a $45 fixed price at 40% of the contract, 60% of the contract reference to the spot price at the time of the delivery. So you actually have a number of utilities that are still receiving deliveries on previously signed contracts that are at least partially referenced to the spot price. So you also have kind of this universal, I don't want to say packed, but understanding that, you know, buying in the spot market is going to move the price up, therefore affecting the price utilities are going to pay on those deliveries coming forward. So it's a bit of a complex market. Now the spot market is primarily driven by financial interests, and that is obviously primarily driven by the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, which is a major development from this year. So I want to ask you about that. The Sprott Physical Uranium Trust was formed in July of 2021 with a NAV of 600 million and 18 million pounds of uranium. And now at the end of 2021, the beginning of 2022, it's sitting with over 40 million pounds of uranium and has a NAV at around $2 billion. With the formation of this product, do you think this was the biggest catalyst of the year for uranium and also the spot market? Yeah, I would say it's one of the biggest catalysts, I mean, since I've been studying this sector in the past five years. So um, it's, yeah, they took over, <clears throat> Sprott took over Uranium Participation Corporation that was formed in 2005. And over those 18 years, UPC had amassed, or excuse me, over those uh, 15 years, UPC had amassed 18 million pounds, like you mentioned, that they took over. Um, <clears throat> since they took over, they purchased 23 million pounds of uranium in, in three and a half months. Most of that was in the first two and a half months. Um, and they've raised over a billion dollars since mid-August. They did a couple of things that was unique that UPC didn't do. One, they immediately did a reverse split that allowed their, the price of the, of the trust to be above a certain level that would open them up to certain institutions that would have a minimal, minimal stock price for any of their investments. That was intelligent. The second thing they did was they applied for an ATM financing vehicle, which would allow them to issue new shares into the open market whenever they're at a greater than 1% premium to their net asset value. And they do so up to 50 to 60% of the daily volume when they are at a premium to the 1% uh, of NAV. And uh, that's the mechanism that they've utilized this ATM to raise that billion dollars in this short period of time. It's a huge catalyst. Um, since in this past, let's see, about six weeks ago, they announced that they're also taking over the URNM ETF, which is the only pure play, the largest pure play ETF in the uranium space. And that'll be happening in February. The shareholder vote is at the end of February. So they've entered in a very, very big way into the uranium market. And um, you know they're, you, you know Sprout, I'm sure, extremely well. They're, they're an absolute powerhouse in the resource space, very highly respected, very competent, um, very well connected. And uh, we believe that they are setting up for what's probably gonna be a pretty strong uh, 2022, 2023 in terms of their uh, participation in the spot market and therefore the price of uranium. We saw a bit of a pullback in the last few weeks of 2021 in the uranium price and even more so in the equities. What's the reasoning for that pullback? It seems like uh, things were getting a little bit overheated in mid-November at the previous, uh, previous highs for the equities. Um, so as soon as equities start to sell off, um, we had a couple of things happen. We had a piece of news come in um, in late October that had to do with uh, the First Nations communities in Canada um, in relation to some of the exploration projects that are up there. And uh, they, they, you know, after some further research, they're, they're essentially pro-mining. They just want to be respected and get uh, their due from these prospective projects that um, is on their land. 
so understandably they they want to they want to make a good deal with the companies that are that are have you know projects on the uh, uh, on the short list for for development so that came in that was a little bit of fud into the market kind of uh, brought the sentiment down a little bit and a few weeks later then we have just kind of broad market concerns we have fears of the omicron variant of covid um, it seems like those fears are subsiding now that some news is coming in and it seems like it's a mild disease um, of course i'm not a doctor but um, it does seem like the fear that came into the markets overall just kind of gave an excuse for a pullback a reversion to the mean and we had uh, most of the stocks in the space pull back not super sharply but consistently over about three to four week period right down perfectly to that 200 day moving average before bouncing um, so you know this is just one of those things that happens uh, over and over in resource markets where you have um, you know pullbacks to the 50 day seem to happen five six seven times a year you get a 200 day pullback once or twice a year and we've seen that that's the second time for 2020 um, so nothing really fundamentally changed and that's the reason why we're still pretty aggressive buyers on that weakness so you see it as a huge opportunity right now? Absolutely, yeah, uh, just absolutely huge. I think that's what we've expressed to our members is this pullback is a gift. And the the fundamentals have not, not only have they not changed um, for the negative, but they've improved over the course of this pullback. And um, the fact that Sprott is taking over this ETF in February, they, they've, uh, they're they applying for the New York Stock Exchange listing in January of 2022, and that should take about six months so we have multiple catalysts on the forefront and that's just that's just talking about the financials in the spot market that's not even talking about the actual concerns of the utilities and some of the other factors affecting the term market and the outlook for the supply and demand going into the future so i want to talk, discuss that now uxc recently reported that 2021 was a record year with about 100 million pounds trading in the spot but they also mentioned that only 10 percent of that actually went to real buyers like utilities. And I just want to hear your thoughts on where you think uh, or what's happening in the spa market and also the term market. Are you hearing like you mentioned earlier that the utilities are, are kind of sitting back and watching what's happening, but are there many RFPs out there? You know, in a, in a strange twist of events, there's actually more action happening in the term market than the spot market right now as we speak. Um, the spot market is dead quiet. We actually spoke to uh, John Champaglia, the CEO of Sprott, this morning, and um, <clears throat> it's, it's just dead quiet out there. There's nothing happening. In fact, in the previous months, when there, when Sprott was trading at a discount to NAV and or they were out of the market during a period where they were um, reinstating a, a higher uh, allowance on their ATM, they were having pounds thrown at them. So that, that were just you know being shaken out of the woodwork and the price kept falling. There was you know, somebody or multiple entities who just wanted uranium off their books at any price, and they just kept kept just throwing it out there and lowering their price and lowering their price, and they just kept taking it. So um, the spot market is you could hear a pin drop in there right now, and I think that has to do with the with the holidays. I think it has to do with the fact that Sprott Physical Uranium Trust has been at a discount to now for about three weeks, with a couple of rare exceptions, but. Um, so they've been out of the market. They're still sitting on some money here, but they haven't. They're kind of sitting on a little cash, little cash stash. Um, and like I mentioned, the utility is not really participating in the spot market for the reasons I already mentioned. The term market, we're definitely hearing there's RFPs coming out. We're hearing that the utilities are getting more and more interested in the 2025 to 2030 timeframe, um, which I think, uh, you know, looking at supply and demand modeling, you'll see that that has the largest structural supply deficit. Once we get out to that, to that. Um, you know, time frame. When you look at the shorter term, when you look at 2022, 2023, 2024, even in 2025, the European utilities are essentially covered. The U.S. utilities are starting to get uncovered once you go out a year or two, and they're pretty uncovered in the 2025 period. But um, most of the world's utilities are mostly covered for the next few years. Interestingly enough, though, some of the liquidity that's come into the spot market in the past few months had to do with um, carry traders selling some of the pounds they were holding in carry in a backwardated market into the spot market and then securing some midterm contracts at a lower price. So what Sprott has essentially incentivized is shaking out some pounds into the present spot market and pulling those pounds from the future. So any utilities that do need to come into the market in that 2023 to 2025 timeframe, the pounds are getting thinner and thinner as traders are selling some of the pounds they're carrying to spot and securing those midterm contracts. Um, one note on the 
uh, long-term contract market is there was a, a couple of Chinese utilities that um, signed contracts with Kazatomprom recently, and some of the data leaked out on these, and that was that uh, these were market-referenced contracts, and um, the time frame wasn't disclosed, but I believe it was probably a 2025 to 2030 plus time frame, considering that it was Chinese utilities and they're pretty covered in the short term. Um, and so, uh, what this contract, the details of the contract were the first two years of delivery, there was a ceiling price of $55 a pound. And all of the remaining years of the contract, the ceiling price was $78 a pound. And so they, and, and the producer was not willing to sign a fixed price contract. They wanted, they wanted uh, exposure to the spot market pricing. And that was the prices that they, that they came up with as a ceiling price. So that's, that's a sea change in terms of the types of contracts that have been signed in the past few years, which have been minimal and uh, mostly fixed or fixed and partial term, uh, partial, partial spot reference. And do you think, given the move that we've had in the in the spot market in 2021, but also the pullback we've seen in the last few weeks, do you think these utilities are going to come alive on the buy side in Q1 and Q2 of this year? I think that there's going to be increasing interest in the term market on the terms of the utilities. Um, I don't think the utilities are going to scramble into the spot market. I just don't see that happening. I think they understand what's going on in the spot market, and unless there's some actual desperation around their short-term needs, which doesn't look likely. Um, it's unlikely they'll be participating in the spot market. So that's going to be driven by traders and the financial interest, mostly, in my opinion. Um, but I do think that the the setup here, considering the thinness of the spot market, considering the fact that the carry traders are, um, when the market is backwardated, selling some of those pounds in the spot market and buying from the future and tightening up that midterm, and considering the types of pricing that some of the contracts, like I just mentioned, are securing going out into the future and the looming deficit in supply, uh, I think that any utilities that know that they will be operating during that time frame are going to be coming into the term market and potentially faster than, than we're expecting. Justin, I want to turn the conversation toward China now. In 2010, China came into the market aggressively. They bought 150 million pounds in one month and doing so they took the price from 30 to 70 dollars and as you mentioned earlier because Adaprom recently announced that it had signed or entered into contracts with two Chinese utilities do you think this is the beginning of a new wave of buying by the Chinese um, it's certainly looking like it yeah in addition to that uh, to the contracts that I mentioned the Chinese have also um, secured another JV with Kazatomprom that was announced a few months back, the Ordelik project in Kazakhstan. That's a, a very good ISR project, so they're securing more pounds. Uh, the Chinese already get roughly 50% of Kazatomprom's production in offtake agreements and, and uh, contracts. So they're already big buyers of uranium coming from Kazakhstan. Um, as we know, they own 20% of Fission. They own 25% of Paladin's Langer Heinrich. They're actually doing a couple of things in terms of Paladin's Langer Heinrich, they're pressuring them to start the mine sooner, and they're wanting a larger share than their 25%. So that's kind of interesting. The other big thing is that they have um, uh, set up a, a warehouse for stockpiling uranium. For stockpiling, I believe it was 25,000 tons, which is about 60 million pounds, on the border of Kazakhstan and China. And so that's gonna be another secondary demand of, of storing uranium for strategic purposes for the country of China. Um, this is all, of course, in, in conjunction with their announcement to have um, 200, was it 200 gigawatts online by 2035? They currently have uh, about 50 gigawatts online right now. So that's roughly 150 new reactors in the next 15 years. They have 18 under construction right now. Now um, they've got 50 something in the in the planned stage, and then there's north of 100 in the proposed stage already. So um, it, it's, you know, all signs are pointing to that they mean business. And um, you, you can talk all day long about how the how pollutive most of their energy sources are currently, especially coal, and how nuclear is a great solution for that. And while that's absolutely true, they are also building coal plants like crazy. They are just going all out growth. And when China goes all out growth, for whatever reasons they have for doing so, they do it. I mean, they do it at any cost. So it's it's likely we're going to continue to hear more announcements of Chinese utilities securing contracts, more announcements of JVs with the with the big producers. 
Um, we could see some actual projects get taken out. That'll most likely happen in Africa, um, probably in Niger. There's some development projects there that look very ripe for the taking. So yeah, as, as far as we can tell, it's 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 game on for China and nuclear. And um, these little pieces that we just mentioned really kind of confirm that they mean business. Let's move on to taxonomy now. And why don't we just start with what exactly is taxonomy and what does it mean to the uranium price? The EU taxonomy essentially is a classification system for um, classifying different sectors, and in this case, different means of energy production as quote unquote green. Um, energy sources that classify as green within the EU taxonomy have access to lower cost funding, and they of course get support from the EU um, in multiple ways. And um, importantly, it also is sort of a, a, a label that investors can use to justify taking positions in this sector, in nuclear, in uranium, um, and allocated by, you know, in ESG funds, funds that are that are committed to investing in environmental, social governance issues. Importantly, this, uh, you know, having uh, nuclear in the green EU taxonomy also will um, justify to ESG funds that it's an investable asset. So ESG funds that have at least part of their capital exclusively allocated to investing in environmental, social governance sectors will now be able to invest in uranium and in nuclear. So that's really kind of, that's the big deal that it means um, for the equities, at least in the short term. In the long term, what it means is there's likely to be increased um, number of countries in the EU that may not have previously been open to nuclear, that now would be open to nuclear, and countries that are already nuclear, like France, 70% um, nuclear in France, they've already announced they're planning to build five more new large reactors, as well as committing a lot of funding, I don't remember the exact number, but to um, small modular reactors. So overall, it's it's mainly just a, a stamp of approval by an entity that historically has not approved of nuclear. So it's a big sentiment sea change, and um, it could mean a lot for um, increased demand going forward, out farther out into the future. In the short term, the the main implications are on the investing side in terms of new funds being able to allocate into that sector based on that stamp of approval. So Justin, it sounds like there's going to be a huge demand from these ESG funds once this taxonomy law is passed. Yeah, it's ESG has really been a, a hugely growing segment of of the financial markets, and that's set to just continue. Um, so even a small allocation from global ESG funds into uranium, into nuclear, could really move the needle for the sector. I want to move on now and get your thoughts on M&A. We've seen a lot of M&A in the precious metals sector here in the last year, especially this past year, 2021. Ignico came in and bought Kirkland Lake for, I believe it was $14 billion. And just recently we saw Kenross Gold buy a development company called Great Bear Resources, and I believe they paid $1.4 billion for that. And we've also seen some M&A activity in the lithium space, but we haven't seen anything in the uranium space. Why? There have been a couple of uh, elements of M&A in the sector, but uh, compared to gold and silver, it pretty much is, uh, is, is far, far less. And that probably has to do with the size of the sector. It's still very, very small. We're still at you know, $35 billion total market cap for the entire sector. Um, there's only 65 publicly traded companies. So there's not a lot of mergers and acquisitions that could actually even you know, theoretically happen in the space. Um, we did see one earlier this year, Encore Energy took over Azarga Energy. Um, that was a, a consolidating of assets and, and uh, that, that was a pretty, that was the biggest M&A piece that we've seen in a while. We also saw recently um, Uranium Energy Corporation uh, take over uh, the assets from Uranium One in the United States. So that was a big acquisition. Um, but you know we see that as at least that there's a little bit happening that that's a sign that's a sign that uh, the companies in the space are kind of confirming that this thing is for real um, in the in the case for the gold sector obviously the equities have not performed all that well in recent in, you know in the recent year year and a half or so but the gold price has held up pretty well and the actual producing companies are just printing cash flow um, so it makes sense that you're seeing M&A there despite the fact that the equities have not been all that strong. In the uranium space, to see any M&A whatsoever is is a confirmation that um, that something is happening here. It's it's a it's a vote of confidence in the future in the next few years of the market that 
that they'll go ahead and take that risk and and have the shareholders approve you know the consolidation of companies the consolidation of assets so it's likely we'll see a little bit more but like i said there's just not a lot of companies out there so um, we'll probably see a bit more maybe and probably not another one this year in the rem what remains of it um, but m most likely we'll see another one or two in 2022 is my expectation Justin, as we wrap up, I want to ask you about both the uranium price and both the short and long term. Kazataprom and Cameco have both been very disciplined with their output of uranium and will continue to do so going forward. In October, Kazataprom announced an investment in a physical uranium fund called ANU Energy. So now there will be three participants in the spot market looking to buy spot uranium. In China, as you mentioned earlier, has also announced some very aggressive plans with their build out of nuclear reactors. They wanna build uh, 150 reactors over the next 15 years. So with all these positive developments, why isn't the uranium price significantly higher than where it is now? Why isn't it at 75 or $100 a pound? The uranium price is primarily driven by actual purchasing and selling of uranium. And so it's not really driven by sentiment um, or by you know the fundamentals of the sector. It's a very, very slow to respond sector. You have um, even the producing mines currently, it takes an enormous amount of capital and a long time for their production to increase. Uh, it's, it has to do with manpower. It has to do with the lag time, um, in particular with ISR mining. So with Kazanaprom, like you mentioned, you know, they're already committed to their budget in 2022 that's been voted on, that's said and done. What that means is there won't be drilling uh, in excess of what they're planning for 2022, which would affect their 2023 production, which is why they've already had, you know, put out guidance through 2023 that's essentially saying we're not producing any more than we're producing currently. 26, you know, 26,000 tons, about 60 million pounds. And so um, the main producers that are currently producing would have a very difficult time ramping in short order to respond to the increased demand that we're seeing in the spot market, for example, coming from the financial interests. So the reason the price isn't moving currently is because nobody's buying currently. We're seeing you know, some term contracts being signed and that will affect the, the long-term pricing. That's only updated once a month at the end of each month. It's not a very visible metric for the investing world to watch. And so this is why you have situations like you had um, this past month where you have unbelievable fundamentals that just continue to, to work uh, you know, extremely well towards the outlook of uranium in the short, mid and long term. But you have the sector selling off, you have the equities acting in an inverse manner. And so um, you always see that profit taking in these markets, but um, it takes an enormous amount of capital a long time. So we've got no increase in production from Kazadam Prom until 2024 minimum, minimum. And that's gonna, and we could even see decreases in production. They've already acknowledged they're having some significant um, supply chain problems. So uh, we have uh, MacArthur River is the other big care and maintenance mine that could come online. If they announce that tomorrow, that would take them 12 months to get to that first pound of production. The first year is 4 million pounds. And then the, then the, it's another year after that until you've got full, full nameplate capacity of 18 million pounds a year. So uh, if they announce that tomorrow, that's 2024. And then you have Paladins, Langer, Heinrich. That can come on a little bit faster, but it's still a big chunk of capital to do so. And it's a much smaller mine than MacArthur River. You know, they're looking at 5 million pounds a year and the Chinese have a 25% offtake. So it's not a, a market killing amount of production to come in. So all of these factors essentially point to primary production is not going to be making up this deficit anytime soon. So then you just have to ask yourself, all right, if the market can't respond to this for three years, what is gonna happen in the next two years? I think if you look at the breadcrumbs from Sprott and from, uh, you know, what, what the Chinese are, are telling us through the moves they've been making, what Kazata Prom is telling us directly, um, I think we can make an informed assumption about what we're likely to see in the next couple of years. So things sound very bullish for the uranium price. It was a 2021 was a great year. What about 2022? Where do you see the price going? Uh, higher and and not only do I see it going higher, um, the the very very ultra conservative nuclear fuel consultants are essentially telling their customers, which are the nuclear utilities, the price is going higher. We can expect the increasing price uranium trend to continue in 2022. How high? I don't know. That's going to be determined by capital flows. That's going to be de be determined by how quickly capital flows can work through. However, however many more pounds are going to shake out from the carry traders. 
I think that Sprott's buying in 2022 alone will blow through whatever the carry traders might be willing to sell into a backwardated market. And so we're likely to see prices. I mean, I don't even want to make price predictions. It's going to be somewhere at least in the 50s and probably higher by the end of 2022. And once we get through any available liquid pounds that come available in the spot market, less than 12 month delivery, once we clear through that, um, and it's not a static bucket of uranium that you can just get to the bottom of and that's it. There's primary production that comes into the market, you know, one and a half, two million pounds a month, roughly. But uh, we believe that the that the demand coming from, and it's not just Sprott, Yellow Cake's got a hundred million uh, dollar, US dollar allocation. Um, that they'll guaranteed they'll utilize that in 2022. Then you've got this ANU Energy. They did a 50 million initial raise that was partially funded by Xatomprom. They're going to do a 500 million carry-on raise uh, in 2022. So it's Sprott, it's ANU. Um, any other potential developing companies might buy physically uranium again, like they did in the beginning part of this year. Any other financial players? I mean, it's it's just ripe. It's ripe for the taking. And um, so I, I think that we'll see a very strong price movement. I, I think we'll likely be in the 60s or north of that by the end of the year, um, end of 2022. And uh, beyond that, who knows? Once we once we clear out what's what will shake out at those price ranges, then I think the move, moves could be a lot more sharp. Justin, that was a great overview of the uranium sector. And I want to thank you for making the time today. To all our viewers, I would suggest you check out Justin's website, Uranium Insider, and also check out his YouTube channel. He does a daily update on the uranium sector and what's happening. I watch it religiously. Once again, Justin, thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.